a lot to go over. Uh, <clears throat> so, uh, sorry, I just got a message. Where's my video? Come on. There we go. Okay, so let's get started because we have a lot to go over today. Um, so last time we were talking about momentum conservation and today we're going to continue talking about that in the context that energy conservation also shows up. So let's talk about momentum and energy. So there is a, there is a relationship between these two things even though they're different quantities to begin with. Yeah, homework is still due as usual. So we have these two really, really strong conservation laws. One of them is particularly useful for solving problems like how high does an object go when you throw it up or uh, given some initial speed or uh, <clears throat> or uh, what is the final speed after it falls down a ramp or something like that. That would be energy conservation. The other conservation law is momentum conservation and it's particularly useful when you have no external forces and you have two things interacting with each other. So let's look at the previous, the example that we covered at the end of last lecture. That was you had a spring or you had a box two springs between them, or a spring between them, and then another box on the other side. And then the spring releases, and the boxes go flying off to, the, to either side. So, this, so in this example, momentum is conserved because there are no external forces here. So <clears throat> now we can actually start to ask questions uh, <clears throat> using both momentum and energy conservation. So we know that initially, uh, the spring has some potential energy, right? When a spring is compressed, it has potential energy, which we know the formula for, one half k x, uh, one half k x minus x naught squared. Um, so if we knew how much potential energy it, it would have, we could figure out how much kinetic energy the system has to have after they're released, because the spring will no longer be compressed. So let's ask what happens to the blocks. And I'm not going to work this out in full detail. But first, first we should note a relationship uh, between momentum and uh, sorry, momentum and kinetic energy. <clears throat> kinetic energy, we, we know the formula for that. It's one half mv squared. Hopefully you guys know that. And so we can do some algebra to that, and we get one half m squared v squared divided by m. But that's one half mv squared divided by m. And mv squared is just p squared, momentum squared. So if you take the square of the momentum and divide it by twice the mass, you get the kinetic energy. So that's a useful, a useful fact. So OK, so, so we have this, uh, this relationship, which keep in, keep in the back of your head. It's, it's super useful. So <clears throat> now we can return to this uh, business with the springs and the blocks. So since since the two blocks, since the two blocks have to have the same magnitude of, can you also differentiate what? I don't, I don't know how that's related. Um, since the two blocks have the same magnitude of momentum, and that's due to momentum conservation, this is. Uh, Due to momentum conservation. <clears throat> uh, what we have is that the momentum of the first block, say the block on the left, let's call this one, this one two, one two, and this is after. The block, the, the square of the momentum on the left should be equal to the square the square of the momentum on the right. And that's just because their magnitudes are the same and the square of a vector just squares the magnitude, right? That's a property of how vector of how the square of a vector works. If you take a dot product of a vector with itself, it just spits out the magnitude squared. So that's all we're talking about here. So we can use this relationship regarding kinetic energy with combined with the relationship about potential energy, about uh, sorry, momentum of each block to figure out the kinetic energy of each block. So the kinetic energy of the first block should be the momentum squared of the first block divided by 2m. And the kinetic energy of the second block 
should be the momentum squared of the second block divided by two times two M because the mass of the second block is two M. But we know that the momenta are the same. P1 squared is the same thing as P2 squared. So this is just P1 squared divided by four M. But if we compare these two, we see that this is one half of the kinetic energy of the first block. And so now you, it, if, if you wanted to proceed, if you knew what the initial potential energy of the, uh, of the spring was, the final kinetic total energy, or the, the final total kinetic energy is three halves, <clears throat> sorry, it's three halves the kinetic energy of just one of them, of just, uh, of just one, and that's just because we found the kinetic energy of each one and then added them together. And then you could go and you could set this equal to the, uh, to the potential energy, the initial potential energy of the spring, and you could solve for the velocity uh, or solve for, the, solve for the momentum P1, for example. Um, <clears throat> so this is just a particularly useful thing to do. I'm not gonna work it out in detail because we haven't actually talked about uh, what to do about the spring here. I didn't give you anything, but this is just an example. Now there's more to do regarding momentum and energy. There's a, there's a lot more that we can get out of it. So we're gonna talk about collisions, which is the more general case that we just talked about. We're gonna talk about elastic collisions. So when we talk about two things colliding, the nature of the force, like what type of force occurs during the collision process, it doesn't really affect momentum conservation, right? Um, and the reason for that is because as long as the force is internal to the system, momentum is conserved. It doesn't. By the way, the plural of momentum is momenta, uh, in case you didn't know. So I'll use that word occasionally. Right, so, so if it's a spring, like let's say you have two blocks and there's a spring in the middle and they come and they collide by both bouncing off the spring, in that case, momentum would be conserved. And it would just as well be conserved as if they like rubbed up against each other and then they like stuck together. Momentum is conserved regardless because those forces are always internal. However, the nature of the force does, it does affect the thermal energy. does affect the change in the thermal energy, right? When we're talking about energy conservation, whether or not the force, the internal forces are conservative or not, that will tell you whether or not the, uh, whether or not energy is lost. So if the collision force is, oh, scroll with you. God, my tablet's running really slow. So, Right, so let me be a little bit more specific. If the collision is springy, I, and the example here is you just have a spring lying in the middle and the two objects come in and they bounce off the spring and then they bounce off. Um, <clears throat> then, i.e. if the force is conservative, the collision force is conservative. We know that, spring, that the spring force is, is a conservative force. So that would be another example, or that would be a simple example. Gravitational collisions can also occur, but they're a little bit hard to, harder to visualize. Um, I.e. if the force is conservative, then we call those collisions elastic. And that's a technical name, like it's, a, it's, it's an official technical definition that I guess you should probably be aware of. Um, on the other hand, if the collision is frictional in nature, like think of the two blocks or the two books, like one sliding on top of the other, that's technically a collision. The two things started out separated and then came together. Um, if it's frictional in nature, i.e. if the force is non-conservative, Then, then we call those inelastic collisions. So 
there's two types of collisions is what it boils down to. There are collisions that involve only conservative forces. These are always elastic collisions. And then there are forces that involve at least one inelastic or one non-conservative force. Those are inelastic collisions. So we're going to talk about the these two different types of uh, collisions in more detail now. So let's start with elastic uh, elastic collisions. Right, so if a collision is elastic, we get an additional constraint, remember what a constraint means, uh, to solve a problem. It's something external to Newton's laws. So let me give an example of this occurring. So let's say that we have, before the collision occurs, we have a single block with mass m moving at, say, speed v, and it's headed right towards a block with mass m moving at speed 0, right? <clears throat> During the collision, uh, I'm just drawing a picture here. They come together, they make some sparks. Sparks, not really, but they collide, right? And then after the collision, something happens. Now, you guys might have the intuition that, uh, just from playing billiards, for example, that if you hit a ball dead on, the, the cue ball will stop and the other ball will move forward at the same speed. Are all forces for elastic conservative or is there some non-conservative forces that would still conserve momentum? Momentum conservation is all, always happens. Elastic elastic collisions just occur when they're. Uh, that means that um, th the change in thermal energy is zero, i.e., basically energy is conserved. But uh, so so by definition, an elastic collision is one where all of the for all of the internal forces for the collision are uh, conservative. That's just by definition. So after the collision, the first block will just sit there because they collided head on and they have the same mass. And the second block would go off with some speed v. Now, so far I've just asserted this. I would have to justify this properly, right? So let's, let's, let's talk about that justification. And we're, this, we're actually gonna work through an example for the first time. So the incoming and the outgoing speeds I claim are the same, but let's figure out why. So there are no external forces here. Yes, momentum is conserved. Um, as long as if there are no external forces, momentum is conserved just always. So, and, and by the way, this is a one dimensional collision. So we're going to, instead of working with vectors, we're just gonna work with numbers like we usually do when we talk about one dimensional motion. So the momentum before should be equal to the momentum after. That's, this is momentum conservation. the change in momentum is zero. And that's because there's no external forces, so the, ex so the external impulse is zero. So what does this imply? It implies that the mass times the velocity of the first block plus the mass times velocity of the second block, which is zero, should be equal to the mass times velocity of the first block plus the mass times the velocity of the second block. That's, that would be after. And so what we're really looking to do is solving for V1 and V2. So what this implies, this equation here, this implies that the initial speed is equal to the sum of the two final speeds. And we're, we're trying to prove that one of those speeds should be zero. That's, that's what we're trying to get at. Now, the fact that this is an elastic collision. Yeah, sorry, uh, I don't know why it. There we go. The fact that this is an elastic collision. I'm going to make sure that I indicate that this is elastic implies that the, well, let's talk about this actually for a minute. So if the collision is elastic, what does that mean? It means that the, all of the internal forces are conservative, are conservative. So already that means that the only things that can, uh, that means that our uh, work energy theorem, which says this, our work energy theorem, we know there are no external forces, so that's zero. And the fact that it's elastic means that all of the internal forces are conservative. So the change in thermal energy is zero. Now, the, the only thing to, to now consider is, is there any potential energy change? And the, the assumption here is that all of the forces occur during the collision and then they're, they're, and then they're done. So we don't have to worry about the potential energy before, before and after because the potential energy only changes during the collision. 
but it, but it goes back to what it was after the collision. So we would ignore, not ignore, but but we we can we can generally assume that the change in potential energy is zero. So what this implies is that the change in kinetic energy is zero. That's what it, this is what it means for there to be an elastic collision. Generally, it means that the energy is conserved and the kinetic energy is conserved. Sometimes in more in more uh, complicated cases, you'll have like uh, an elastic collision that involves something going up in a gravitational well, so there will be potential energy. But in this simple case, there, the only forces present are the ones that occurred during the collision. And so as long as those forces don't continue to act after the collision, there are no potential energies to worry about. All right, so this means that the kinetic energy before should be equal to the kinetic energy after. And so we can write that out. So that's one half m times v squared. So v is the initial speed, by the way. Um, and then v1 and v2 are the final speeds of each block. Plus 0, because the, the kinetic energy of the second block is 0. And this is equal to 1 half mv1 squared. That's the, that's the speed of the first block, plus 1 half mv2 squared. And so what we get from this equation is we get that v squared should be equal to v1 squared plus v2 squared. All right, so now we can combine these two equations. So, so what we've done, by the way, is we've used our two energy conservation equations to derive two equations that talk about our velocities. So let's do some algebra. So we know that v is equal to v1 plus v2. That's from, this, uh, from, from momentum conservation. And so what that implies, we can just square both sides of this equation. That, that implies that v squared should be equal to v1 plus v2 squared, which we can just uh, expand. This is v1 squared plus 2 v1 v2 plus v2 squared. But also, we know that uh, v squared, this is from energy conservation, is equal to v1 squared plus v2 squared. Right, that's from the energy conservation equation that we got. And so these two things have to be equal. This is the land of the long equal sign. Um, and so what we're left with, and that's because they're both equal to v squared. What we're left with is that v1 squared plus 2v1 v2 plus v2 squared. No, this is so, so no, this is a special, this is just an example. This is equal to v1 squared plus v2 squared. All I'm doing is I'm using the equations that we derived from the from the uh, conservation equations, and so these these terms all cancel, and we're left with two v one v two equals zero, which implies that either v one equals zero or v two equals zero. And you know it's it like that's the that's the general uh, way that you would solve an algebraic problem like this. Now you might ask the question: Why is it possible that one or the other could be zero? Well, consider for a moment that let's say that at, that the first mass, the mass that was initially moving, let's say it just completely misses the second mass. It just never hits it. Well, technically, that would be an elastic collision. And the reason for that is because there would be no forces, and so the force would so it would of course be elastic. And that would imply that v two is zero, and v one is just equal to whatever whatever you would get. It's just equal to v. It's just equal to v. Alternatively. Um, so, well, so what does this imply? This implies v1 equals 0 uh, and v2 equals v, or v2, v1 equals v, and v2 equals 0. So these are the two cases that we have um, just from using uh, the mo momentum conservation equation again. So if, if the first block misses the second block, then the first block will just continue on with it whatever speed it had, and the second block will just continue to stay at rest. That's the second option here. If instead the first block hits the second block, what we find is that the first block will just stop and the second block will start moving. And that's exactly what we see with like billiard balls, right? If you hit a ball dead on, the cue ball stops and the other ball just starts going. And so, so this is why. It's because those are, those are almost exactly elastic collisions. So there are other type. Uh, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll get to that, Jason. Um, so there are other examples that, that we could, in, in theory, go over. By the way, I'll probably go over like 10 minutes today because we do have a lot to go over and I want to make sure we finish it. Um, so you could have another example of an elastic collision where the first block has twice the mass of the second block. And then you'd have your collision. 
I will answer all of those questions after lecture. And then something happens. Maybe this block keeps moving, but with a, but with a different speed. And then this block starts moving with a different speed. And you could apply the same, the same calculational techniques that I used in the previous example to solve this. You would just have to write down what the momentum is initially, what the momentum is finally in terms of V1, V2, and V, and then do the same for energy. And you would find what the final velocities are just by doing some algebra. Um, Alternatively, you could do another example. Actually, I'm not going to write this. I'm not going to write this out, but you can see it on the lecture notes. Another example would just be what happens if you start off with a block that has mass m and it hits a block with mass 2m. Then what? Well, in that case, your intuition might agree with what happens in reality. You would find actually that the block with mass m actually reverses course. course. And the way that you would see that when you're doing your calculation is you would find that v1 is actually negative, i.e., it points to the left rather than to the right. Of course, in all of these, by the way, I've assumed that plus x is in the right direction. And we have to make that, we have to, we do have to choose a coordinate direction because that's, uh, that's what the sign, S-I-G-N, of the velocity means, right? It means left or right. So elastic collisions are actually pretty easy. You just write down the kinetic energy initially in, uh, in the initial and final states, write down the momentum conservation or the momentum in the initial and final states, at least in one dimensions, and that's it. You get two equations, you have two variables, and you solve. Uh, almost always you will have exactly two variables. Maybe you'll have to work a little bit harder to get those, but in general, that's what it boils down to. Um, <clears throat> there are other, uh, there's another type of collision though, which, which can be a little bit more complicated at least to think about, and that is the inelastic collision. So the inelastic collision has two varieties. Yes, we, we're going to do 2D collisions today. And there's a 2D collision on, or there's one or two 2D collisions on your, on your homework. So the, there are two types of inelastic collisions. So the first type is, and these are more like two types of problems that you'll get. The first type would be, let's say you're told or you are able to calculate how much mechanical energy is lost during the collision. Now remember, an inelastic collision is a collision where, um, not duration, is a collision where the uh, where one of where at least one of the collision forces is non-conservative, and what that means is that there will be a change in thermal energy in the system. And so when we say that mechanical energy is lost, what we really mean is that this is in this type of problem, you might be told or you'd be able to figure out how much of that mechanical energy was converted to thermal energy. Um, let me just write, write that down in equations. So generally, there's no external forces for collisions, unless there are, but that's a more complicated case. And you'd have the change in kinetic energy, and then we would ignore the change in potential energy like normal. But there would be a change in thermal energy because some of that, some of that uh, mechanical energy can be converted via non-conservative forces to thermal energy. And so this number here, this would be the amount of energy lost. So the, the kinetic energy goes down after the collision, and that's because the thermal energy goes up by that amount. So if you were told that, say, the, uh, after the collision, 10 joules of energy are lost, you would write delta Ke plus 10 joules equals zero. And then you would have to write out what delta Ke is. And this would, it, so, so this is not quite energy conservation. I mean, it is in a sense. But instead of having the initial kinetic energy equals final kinetic energy, you would just have initial kinetic energy equals final kinetic energy minus 10 joules or uh, plus 10 joules. And so it just changes the type of equation. But at the end of the day, it's the same type of algebra that you're doing. You're just, you have two equations and two variables. Yeah, that would be like the thermal energy. And this is just, it's just some random example. Like if you were told 10 joules of energy were lost due to internal heating of the two things after they collided. The second type of inelastic collision has a technical name, 
These are totally inelastic collisions. Totally inelastic collisions. So this second type really boils down to a physical phenomenon that you would observe or that you'd be told about. In these cases, the two colliding objects become attached or they stick together. Now you could work out why this means that the uh, collision has to be um, non-conservative, but uh, the, the way to think about this is like if you throw two clay ball two clay balls at each other, assuming they stick to each other, like the balls are going to be deforming when they when they collide, and like none of like none of that def like the energy associated with the, or the forces associated with deforming the balls those are non-conservative because they're not they're not springy in the way a conservative force is. But the the uh, the upshot of the fact that these two objects collide at the end of the day implies that the two objects have the same final velocity as each other. So with that in mind, we don't need energy conservation to solve problems for totally inelastic collisions. And the reason for that is kind of purely algebraic, right? The reason why you would need energy conservation and momentum conservation to solve elastic collision problems is because at the end of the day, usually there's two variables that you're solving for. And so you need two equations that are true in order to solve for two variables. However, if you're, if you're instead told that the collision is, inelast is totally inelastic, then you still have momentum conservation. That's, still, that's, that's always there. But instead of having energy conservation, now you're just told V1F equals V2F. And that's enough. That, that, that is another equation. You just need, so it, it doesn't matter what two equations you have. As long as they're both true, you can solve for the two variables you need. Um, <clears throat> so totally inelastic collisions. So in, let me just summarize that. Instead of using delta ke equals zero, you just use v1f equals v2f. And that's, that, that's all it boils down to. So these type of collision problems, what they really are is you write down the, you write down the momentum conservation, you write down the initial momentum, the final momentum, set them equal, and then you just have to establish what type of collision it is. And sometimes the collision, sometimes it'll be embedded in a problem like, um, the, the, the common example is like the, the two clay sticking together. So I don't want to use that one. Um, you could say that two rubber or like two bouncy balls collide and bounce off each other. It's not explicitly laid out, but the fact that these things are bouncy and springy indicates at least to me, somebody who's done this a lot, that the uh, that this would be an elastic collision because springy forces tend to be conservative. Um, I mean that's obviously that's not one hundred percent true because nothing's very few things are truly con uh, conservative. So so those so tip go back and look up here. So the v one and the v two are the final speeds or are the speeds of block of, of object one and object two. When we're talking about a collision, you're talking about two things colliding, right? So those are just the speeds of or the velocities of the first object and the velocity of the second object. Yeah, and so they're sticking together, so they have to be moving at the same rate. That's all it is. <clears throat> so I just want to briefly go over, and I will do an example of this. Um, uh, collisions in multiple dimensions. And during the exam review session, we can go over more examples, but I likely won't have a whole lot of collision stuff on the exam. So this is more useful for your uh, homework. So let's talk about collisions in multiple dimensions. So it may seem like I just kind of like skipped by examples for collisions in 1D, but collisions in 1D are really easy. It's literally just you write down the two equations that you have and then solve. <clears throat> 
Um, collisions in multiple dimensions can get significantly trickier, so I want to spend some, at least some time going over it. Although in principle, it's just the same, like they're the same concepts. So let me draw a picture. Uh, so let's say that we have before, we have maybe a, some ball uh, with mass m1 traveling to the right with speed v. Or with velocity v. And then it's going to hit a ball that's initially stationary. And maybe it's going to hit the ball like at an off angle or something. And so like you could like it could ricochet off each other. And so before, what we have is we have the momentum, the total momentum in the x direction is just m1 times v. Oh, and uh, let me draw some axes. <coughs> and the momentum in the y direction, it's just 0, because the momentum of each part in the y direction is 0. This one has no momentum at all in either the x or, or y direction. And this one has no momentum in the y direction because it's moving in the x direction. Its velocity is in the x direction. All right, and so then they would collide. And so, you know, one ball hits the other ball, the big collision. And then afterwards, something happens. And it depends on a lot of things. So um, maybe, they collide, maybe they collided here. And then one ball goes off in this direction. Maybe this is the second ball. Call it theta two. And then the other ball maybe goes off in this direction. That would be V1. And so the question is, is how do we figure out what these quantities are? Well, let's write down what the momentum is of the system before or after the collision. So we could break down Oh, that should be, sorry, that should be theta, theta one. We can break down those velocity vectors into components using, their, using trig, right? So the x component of the momentum of ball one after the collision, that would be m1 v1 times cosine of theta one. So that would just be this triangle here. So v1 cosine theta 1 is the x component of the velocity of ball 1. And then ball 2 would be m2 v2 cosine of theta 2. That would be the momentum in the x direction. Because all we did is we found the velocities of each part in the x direction, multiplied them by their masses, and added them together. Now, <clears throat> the momentum in the y direction can be done similarly. We have to be a little bit careful here, because this angle is measured in the, uh, or the y component of uh, this velocity vector is downwards. So we have to put in that angle there, or uh, put that in there. So for the first ball, it would be negative m1 v1 sine of theta 1 plus, and in this case, it's going up. The velocity vector of the second ball is going up. So plus m2 v2 sine of theta 2. Okay, so those are the moment, those are the momenta after the collision in each component. Now, when we remember when we talk about momentum conservation, momentum is a vector. So a, a vector not changing means that none of the components change. So our equations then are actually twofold. The momentum conservation equation is the following, or or equations. So in the x direction. We know that the initial momentum is m1 v, just looking up here. And that should be equal to the momentum in the x direction after the collision. m1 v1 cosine of theta 1 plus m2 v2 cosine of theta 2. And then we can do the same in the y direction. Initially, the momentum in the y direction is 0. And we know what the momentum is after the collision. So this is minus m1 v1 sine of theta, sine of theta 1, plus m2 v2 sine of theta 2. So this is, so this is, these are our two momentum conservation equations. Now, clearly, this isn't enough to solve the problem. There's four variables, right? Assuming you're given the initial velocity v. There's the angles, the two angles, and the two velocity, the, the two velocity magnitudes, v1 and v2. 
So clearly we would still need more information. Now, if, if, the, if, this, equation, the, if this equation was elastic, then we could use energy conservation. The initial energy is 1 half m1 v squared. And the final energy would just be the sum of the kinetic energies after the collision, m1 v1 squared plus 1 half m2 v2 squared. The y component is equal to 0 because the initial y component was equal to 0, and it's conserved. So the momentum, the momentum doesn't change in, in all, the, all the directions. All I did was I, yeah, so I said p before equals p after. If the collision was inelastic, we would have a different equation. We would have that the initial, the initial kinetic energy minus the change in thermal energy, this is how much energy would be lost. So assume, assume that like maybe five joules were lost. You would take the initial kinetic energy and subtract off five joules from it, and then set that equal to the final kinetic energy. Equals 1 half m1 v1 squared plus 1 half m2 v2 squared. So, so only one of these would apply. You'd have to figure out which one applies. And if they were like bouncy balls, then it would, they would be elastic. If they were like mud balls, then they would be inelastic. But still, that would only give you one more equation. So you would need to know something else. And so that something might be something like um, ball two shoots off in the y direction. That tells you information about, say, the y component of the uh, velocity vector for ball two. And so that would give, so, so the point I'm trying to get at is in multiple dimensions, just momentum and energy conservation often isn't enough. And one way to see that is that. Um, or what one way to visualize that is that it kind of depends on like what uh, on like how the balls collide, right? Like if the two balls just glance off each other, they'll go off in different directions than if they collided head on. And so because we haven't really provided any information about how the collision occurs, of course you can't figure out what the end result is without knowing how that collision occurs. You need one more piece of information, which can come in the form of the final angle of one of the balls or the magnitude of the speed of one of the balls or just some other piece of information. Because then you would have four equations and four variables. And then you could actually solve and, and do the algebra. Now, the algebra won't be necessarily easy, but conceptually, it's very much the same. Uh, in, in, so the, these multidimensional collisions are, they, like they, they can be tricky algebraically. Like I'm not, gonna, I'm not gonna lie to you and say, oh, it's just algebra. Like, no, they, they can be challenging. One of the homework problems is challenging. Um, but conceptually, there's nothing really different between multiple dimensions, multiple dimensional collisions, and uh, one dimensional collisions. It's just you apply momentum conservation, write out the momentum in each direction, set them equal to each other before and after, and then figure out what energy, uh, what energy condition you have. Do you have energy conservation? Do you have some amount of energy that's lost? Is it totally inelastic, which would tell you about their final speeds and so on? So there's just there's just a bit to learn. Um, yeah, you, like like trig is 100% involved when you do uh, 2D collisions. It's just a fact of life. Now, there's a very there's a very particular elastic collision in 2D that I want to talk about, which is a well known result. Um, and so I want to go over it. Sorry, physics is or anything that involves three dimensional space or even two dimensional space involves trig. It's just a reality. So suppose we have an elastic collision. Suppose we have an elastic collision, an elastic 2D collision, where the masses are equal. So imagine just two, uh, two identical objects colliding in two dimensions. Now, we don't know how they collide, but we're going to do some, um, some mathematical trickery to learn something special. So because they are elastic, we have energy conservation. And so we can write that out. We could have written it out as just, um, uh, and, and by the way, the, the standard thing that we do for collisions, especially when we're talking about 2D collisions, is we just work in the reference frame where one of the balls is stationary. Because then you only have to deal with one thing for the initial momentum, and then the final momentum is whatever it is. So we're just going to assume that one of our objects is stationary here. So energy the energy conservation equation is that the initial kinetic energy is equal to the final kinetic energy. And so let's just assume one of the balls is stationary. Assume one object 
initially stationary. And you don't have to do this. It just kind of makes the calculations a little bit easier. That's all. So remember, we had that equation um, that the kinetic energy can be written as the momentum squared divided by twice the mass, right? So <clears throat> by the way, I'm going to call the mass of these objects since they're the same. I'm just going to call it m. So our energy conservation equation then becomes p squared, which is just the initial p squared over 2m, which is the initial kinetic energy of the first moving of the block that's moving initially. And that's equal to p1 squared divided by 2m plus p2 squared divided by 2m. So the standard thing that we do, again, regarding notation, is if only one thing's moving initially, we don't put subscripts on it. So like before, we had initially just one ball was moving, and so it had a speed just v. And then after, there were speeds v1 and v2, which are the final speeds of the, of the corresponding balls. We're doing the same thing here. This is the initial momentum of the, of the moving object. This is the final momentum of moving object number one, the final momentum of moving, moving object number two. All right, so because they all have the same mass, we can just do some algebra and we would just get that p squared is equal to p1 squared plus p2 squared. All right, so far so good. It's that this is a useful formula, so I'm gonna put a box around it. Now, I want, I want you guys to remember that P squared really means, remember, the momentum is a vector. P squared really means the dot product of P with itself, right? That, that's what it means to square a vector. And momentum conservation would tell us that the initial momentum should be equal to the final momentum. And so how do we do that? Well, that's the initial momentum is P, so it's a vector. And this is equal to the final momentum, which is just the sum of the momentum of each of the momenta of each object, right? So this is also a useful equation. It's just a way of writing out momentum conservation. And so put a box around that. And so we can actually use these two equations. We can plug this into P and do some simplifying. So that implies that P squared, which is equal to P dot P, well, from momentum conservation, that's equal to P1 plus P2 dot P1 plus P2, right? That's just a true thing. And so we can actually expand by using, just by foiling, that this is P1 dot P1 plus two times P1 dot P2 plus P2 dot P2. And simplifying, we get P1 squared plus 2p1 dot p2 plus p2 squared. Sorry, without the vector symbol. <clears throat> so this is, so p squared is equal to this. So that's just, a, so all I did was I just applied um, momentum conservation to the value of p squared. But now we can combine these, combine these two equations. And so they're both, both the left-hand side of both is equal to p squared. So that means that the right-hand sides have to be equal. So what we get is we get p1 squared plus 2p1 dot p2 plus p2 squared equals p1 squared plus p2 squared. And I know that this is a lot of math, but I promise we're going to get somewhere. So again, these all cancel. Now, this, is, this should be reminiscent of the two objects that are colliding head-on uh, that have equal mass in, when we were talking about one-dimensional collisions. So this is a generalization. This is what happens in the same situation, but now they don't have to collide head-on. They could collide at odd angles. And so what this implies is that, oops, is that two times P1 dot P2 equals zero. Now this doesn't mean P1 or P2 is equal to zero because these are vectors. But remember what the dot product means. The dot product is equal to the magnitude, the product of the magnitudes times the cosine of the angle between them. So we have two times P, the magnitude of P1 times the magnitude of P2 times the cosine of the angle between them equals zero. This is angle between uh, P1 and P2. So either P1 or P2 is zero. So let's assume that that's not the case. So long as 
basically we're assuming that the collision actually occurs and that both objects do start moving. So long as P1 is not equal to zero and that's not also not equal to P2, what that means is that cosine of theta has to be equal to zero. And what does that mean for theta? It means that theta is 90 degrees. And so the interpretation here is that as long as the masses don't collide head on, i.e. so that one of them just stops and the other keeps going, uh, when they ricochet, one goes off in one direction, one goes off in the other direction, they go off with, an ang with a relative angle of 90 degrees. So the picture here is you have one ball comes in, hits another ball, and then they both go off at a relative angle of 90 degrees. Now, this statement that I've just made is only true when their masses are equal. But this is how, like, if you wanted to simulate billiards, this is exactly how you'd do it, because the masses of all the billiard balls are the same, at least nearly, or at least approximately. And all the collisions are, are very nearly elastic. So basically, what you could do is you could just if, figure out what direction you want one ball to go in, and the other ball will always go 90 degrees off from it. So if you if you know if you're if you know you're a big 900 IQ big brain who can calculate these stuff in your head while you're doing these calculations, then now you win at billiards all the time. Um, all right, so I do still have more to go, so I definitely am going to go, uh, but probably about ten minutes over. Um, so I'm not going to go over the totally inelastic 2D collisions. Um, the lecture notes are going. Uh, I, I, Oh, actually, no, this is fine. I actually can go over those. Um, oh, what just happened? Come back. OK, there. All right, so let's talk about totally inelastic 2D collisions. So that was just a particular example, um, but it's a useful example for these types of uh, problems. It's a useful thing to understand why this happens. So like I mentioned before, when we were talking about totally inelastic collisions, v1 has to equal v2 as vectors, because that's what totally inelastic means. Totally inelastic means v1 is equal to v2. Those are the final velocities of the two objects. So let's look at an example, because examples are easy to learn with. So you have, let's say you have, um, m1 going in with some speed, uh, v1, uh, let, let, let me put an f here. So it's the final final velocity, v2f, because then we can have initial velocities as well, v1i. And then you have another block or another ball that's coming in with, say, v2i, maybe with some different mass, m2. So this would be before the collision. And then after the collision, After the collision, this is totally inelastic, which means that they get stuck together. So then you would have just these two things just sticking together, maybe going off in that direction with some angle theta. And the speed that they would have would be whatever it is. You'd, like that's that that might be what you have to calculate. That might be your um, that might be the goal to find the speed and the angle that they go off with. If you're given all of this initial data, you can actually calculate that without needing to know anything else. Um, <clears throat> because that's two equations and two variables. Um, and so, so, this, so this final V would be equal to V1F, which is also equal to V2F. That's what we mean when we say they stick together. They have the, the, if they become attached, then they have to have the same velocity, right? So that's just an example of how you could have a totally inelastic 2D collision. Um, V2J, what? No, 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 no. Those aren't in, those aren't I components. Those are init. The, the the subscript I stands for initial. All right. So those are just a few examples. Now I'm going to give some classic examples of problems that you would have to solve. Now one of these problems, or at least very much a lookalike of one of these problems, is um, on the homework. And this is the ballistic pendulum. So the ballistic pendulum is a particular setup where you have a, uh, oh, oh, 
and I'm almost done. I just want to go over a few examples before I call it, where you have like a large wooden block, say, tied to a ceiling, and then you shoot a bullet at it. A uh, large block has mass big M, bullet has mass little m, and the bullet has some speed, say V. And so that the bullet hits the block, it embeds itself in the block, and then they both swing up as like a pendulum. So the bullet is you know, somewhere embedded in the block. So the, the combined thing has mass capital M plus little m. And maybe the, and this swings up to some angle or it swings up to some height. Or something. And so standard types of questions for ballistic pendulums would be things like, how high does the pendulum swing up? If the bullet started off, if the bullet has this mass, the block has this mass, and the bullet starts out with speed 200 meters per second. And so this seems complicated, but the but the way that you handle this problem is you handle it by breaking up this uh, the scenario into two sep or two two different time intervals. So the trick here is during the collision. So while the block is hitting the pen the pendulum, we know that this is completely inelastic. And the reason for that is the bullet becomes embedded in the block, which means that the that they stick together, right? And so you could find the velocity, the final velocity of the combined bullet and block, given the initial conditions of the bullet and the block separately. And then given that initial, and then, <clears throat> uh, so, so that would be during the collision. I, I should add in that word. So during the swing, so you can think of it as the bullet hits the block and the block and the bullet block gets some velocity. And then together they swing up. So during the swing, this is just energy conservation. And the reason energy is conserved is because the only thing, the only force acting on the bullet and block combination after, after the collision, so after the collision's already happened, is gravity, right? Gravity is the only force, it's just pulling it down. There's also the normal force, but keep in mind that it's the, the or sorry, the tension force from the from the rope, but it's swinging in a circle. And so the tension force will always be perpendicular. So we can ignore it. It doesn't do any work. Um, and so the trick here is you'd set up is you, you set this problem up in stages. So you find uh, step one, find VF after collision, that is the final velocity of the bullet plus block combined object. And then step two, find the kinetic energy um, before the swing, given that VF, this is before the swing, but after the collision. And then step three would be to apply energy conservation. To find the height. So there is, I think it's problem three on the homework is a uh, ballistic pendulum. It's a, it's a little bit more complicated version of a ballistic pendulum, but it is a ballistic pendulum. Um, in that case, the bullet actually passes through, um, but we're told information about the final velocity of the bullet and the initial velocity of the bullet and so on. And so it is still solvable, but it's just not totally inelastic anymore, which complicates things a little bit, but it doesn't make it impossible to solve. Now there's another example that I'm not gonna go into detail about. It's just the stacked balls example. I actually won't write anything about it, but it will be in the lecture notes that I'm gonna upload. So this is just, uh, have you ever seen this demo? And I, I, if I could do this in person, I would, but you take like a bunch of rubber balls stacked on top of each other where the, the biggest one is at the bottom and the, it, they get smaller as they go higher up. And then you drop them all together. And then the ones at the bottom don't really bounce a whole lot, but the one, up, the one on the top goes shooting off into space. It's a really cool demo. I suggest you look it up, um, but Regardless, it's really nifty. And you can understand how these work using energy conservation. And I would suggest that you look into it because it's kind of neat. The last thing to talk about, which I think is also on the homework, so that's why I want to talk about it, is Newton's cradle. So you guys have seen these toys. Uh, these are like those, uh, there's like a, 
strings with a whole bunch of balls attached. And if you lift one up and then you let it swing, um, let it swing down and then it'll like collide and then one ball will go up to the, will go up on the other side. And if you pull up two balls, then two balls will go up on the other side and so on. So understanding exactly why the Newton's cradle sends up the correct number of balls, that, that understanding that is a result of understanding elastic collisions because all of the collisions in a Newton's cradle are assumed to be elastic or they're very, very nearly elastic. And so you can figure out what the, uh, the initial kinetic energy, the initial momentum and so on by using uh, and relating those to the final kinetic energy and final momentum um, by using collision mechanics. Um, all right, so, and I will upload all of this stuff later. Um, that's, that, that is exactly as far as I wanted to get, um, which is good. I know we kind of had to rush along, but it's, a, it's the downside of having a lecture in class. Um, so I'm gonna stop recording here.